going to Little Rock Church of Christ, especially our visitors. Thank you for coming, uh, especially those who are watching on YouTube, Facebook Live. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. Our times of worship service, 930 Bible class on Sunday morning, 1030 worship service. We also have a worship service at 5 p.m. this evening. We will also have a guest speaker this evening, Nicole Spear. We have a Bible class Wednesday night, 7 p.m. We also invite you to tune in to What is True, KARZ Channel 42, 8 a.m. Sunday morning. You can also catch What is True at any time on our Facebook page. Our worship service today is song leader Paul Brightweiser. Leading us in communion is Barrett Allen. Giving us the lesson today is Don Patton. And closing prayer will be brought to us by Mike Zini. Right now, before we get started, prepare our minds with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we're so thankful to be here this morning. So thankful for the freedom, freedom that we have to come and worship you. Thank you so much for this country that we live in and all the freedoms that we have. Pray that you'll be with those who lead this country. Pray that you'll be with those who govern our bodies locally. Pray that you'll be with those nurses and doctors that are dealing with this COVID. Pray that you'll give them strength. Pray that you'll be with those who have been uh, stricken with COVID. Ask that you will continue to be with us through this service. Pray that the things that are said and done here are most pleasing unto you. And that we will take home what we've learned, open up our Bibles at home, study, and become stronger Christians than we were the day before, spreading the gospel throughout the land. Pray, pray that we will be able to give an answer for what we believe. Pray that you'll be with us as we go through this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Him will be number 412, uh, Solid Rock. <clears throat> okay. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covered, not his blood. Support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. <clears throat> when He shall come with sound, oh, may I then in, in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Prayer of Minds 4, our partaking of the Lord's Supper and remembering our Lord's death and sacrifice, we'll sing number 282, Break Thou the Bread of Life. <clears throat> okay. Okay. 
break thou the bread of life dear lord to me as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea beyond the sacred page I seek thee Lord my spirit pants for thee O living word last thou the As thou didst bless the bread by Galilee, then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my As we prepare to partake of the unleavened bread and fruit of the vine, I'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, where it talks about how we are redeemed through the blood of Christ. But well, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. In verse 22, indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Let us give thanks for the bread. Our Father God in heaven, we come to you at this time thanking you for blessing us to be able to arise on this morning and to come out and worship you, Father, in this assembly. Father, we come praying for this bread. We're thankful for the sacrifice and your son coming down 
at your direction, Father, to die on the cross for our sins. We pray that everyone that's about to take of this bread has examined themselves and will do so in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give thanks for the cup. Our Father, God of heaven, we continue our the prayer unto you at this time, Father, as we are about to partake of this cup, which represents the blood that was shed by your son. Father, we're asking that everyone who's about to take it will do so in a manner that's pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the first day of the week, we are also commanded to give back to the local church here where we all assemble. We find where it's commanded, how we're, when we're supposed to give in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And the funds that are taken up will support the work of the church here locally where we do assemble. And those funds will support the work here based upon... New Testament Christianity as outlined in God's Word. We also find in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, the, our, the manner in which our heart should be when we give and how our attitude should be when we give. Let us give thanks for the offering. Father God in heaven, we come to you at this time, Father. Thankful to be able to give back a portion of what you have blessed each and every one of us with, Father. We pray that we search our hearts. We pray that we have prepared ourselves to be able to give. And we pray that the funds that are taken up will continue to be used to further the cause of Christ here at this congregation, Father, and the work that we do. These things we pray and ask in Christ our Lord and Savior, in Jesus' name, amen. Good to see each one this morning, especially those visiting with us. We want each of you to feel welcome. We're missing a lot of our own, and so I guess visitors are especially appreciated this morning. I'd like to talk to you about a passage that we find in Proverbs chapter 30, where Solomon is talking about little creatures and teaching lessons that we need to learn and take to heart from those little creatures. Typically, we're impressed by the big things. Uh, Solomon was, and he built big things, very wealthy and uh, impressive things. Sometimes we miss the lessons from little things, and he's calling our attention to those and demonstrating wisdom from these little creatures that we need to learn to apply to our lives. There are actually two points that I see in this passage. First is that wisdom which Solomon says we need to apply to our lives that we can learn from other creatures. 
but also a more obvious point, or at least to me, it, it's not stated specifically by Solomon, but a very obvious point, that these little critters didn't figure this wisdom out for themselves. They didn't sit down on a hot rod and say, this is the way I'm going to do this. And then they didn't turn around and teach it to their kids perfectly. He taught it to their kids perfectly. Especially if you've got hundreds of kids. That's just what we're saying is it is an obvious argument for God. Solomon said those who deny that there is a God are fools. Because of such obvious points. There are many today, as was the case then, who are committed to an ungodly lifestyle and therefore refuse to acknowledge God. Jesus, quoting Isaiah, said they closed their eyes. They stopped their ears. So, from those two perspectives, let's look at these creatures and begin first with the point that most people are looking for the big stuff. Naaman objected to God's methodology in curing his leprosy. He wanted some big showy uh, operation. Call him and just have a big ceremony. A little simple dipping in the River Jordan wasn't enough. Well, let's focus our attention on the little things this morning. Beginning with the ants. Solomon says the ants are not a strong people. Well, relative to their size, they're amazingly strong. But they're not like an elephant by any means. There is awesome design that is clearly seen, especially as we look at the different types of ants that are obviously designed to do certain jobs. Solomon says they prepare their food in the summer. And some people are wise enough to do that. Some don't look that far ahead and find themselves in trouble when the winter of life appears. The harvester ants are excellent examples of this wisdom. They carry seeds back to their nest and store them up in a very orderly manner for the winter. We're reminded of Solomon's words in Proverbs 30. Go to the ant, O sluggard, observe her ways and be wise. I can't read that without hearing Brother Homer Haley with his preacher boys grinding that in. <laughs> we heard that over and over. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest so will your goods be reduced to waste. He didn't want lazy preacher boys. He didn't sit. Anyway, go to the end, you sluggard. Solomon was plain and clear. Having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer, gathers her provisions in the harvest. Did you know how to do that? The ant certainly does and does so very effectively, diligent, none more industrious, none of them born tired or slackers or shirkers. They don't go on, go on strike, they, they have one motto and that, that work. And you can't watch ants without seeing that. The leaf cutter ants are especially interesting. They cultivate mushrooms that's a pretty good trick. Reading here from Wikipedia, uh, leaf cutter ants can carry more than 5,000 times their body weight, cut and process fresh vegetation, leaves, flowers, and grasses. Now, this is a combination of these flowers, grasses that make a certain recipe that's necessary to grow mushrooms, and they carry those. Uh, ingredients back to their nest 
And then they have rooms down underground where they control the humidity and the temperature to perfection with engineering that we can learn from. This is a picture of the underground nest. And there are different temperatures and different humidities that grow different heights. And you see that as would be indicated from the depth and the size. Deep cutter ants can carry, uh, it goes on to describe, they serve as nutritional substrates for the fungal covet, covetars. Uh, that, that's another word for mushroom garden. Um, and they are really good at it. BBC News published an article, Why Ants Make Great Gardeners. The insects sometimes called parasol ants cut half moon shaped pieces of leaf from trees, carry them to their nest on their backs. The leaves make a sponge-like fungus garden the leaves are mashed up to support the growth of special fungus which the ants do. The leaves make a sponge-like fungus garden. The leaves are mashed up to support the growth of special fungus. They also, believe this, this is from the BBC, use antibiotics to protect the fungus. People think, well, maybe you ought not to do that. Well, the ants have been doing that for a long time, and God taught them how. The ants use antibiotics to fight off the fungal infection. It's a mutualistic association with a third organism, a bacterium. The ants actually culture and grow this bacterium on their bodies. Bacteria actually produce antibiotics that support specialized pathogens of the fungus garden. And looking at that picture, you can see pretty well the growth of that um, bacteria, the antibiotic that's used to produce their fungus garden. Ants do, however, have no bosses directing operations or policing the gardeners. Almost like the BBC had read Solomon here as he describes their work. Professor Nigel Franks, Bristol University, told the discoverer uh, he had, uh, he believed ant organisms could have huge lessons for humans. It's an immense management problem. We can work out how the social insects manage their labor. I think it could give us a really deep insight for organization of our own factories. And I think Christians could profit by ants' wisdom here. Prepare for the future and use ingenuity to manage. Uh, I can recall in Apopka, Florida, when I was preaching for a while, I had an association with some people who were members of the church there who worked in the Campbell Soup Factory, not the Soup Factory, the, the mushroom factory that provided mushrooms for Campbell Soup. It was a huge operation. The building, stand at one end, you couldn't see the other end. Huge. Didn't have to be very tall to grow mushrooms, tall enough to stand up in, but they had prepared very carefully the metrics that they were growing the mushrooms in. They controlled the temperature, they controlled the humidity. They had 15, and I remember this, we were, had, had a connection with it, but they had 500 horsepower motors, 15 of them in a row. Now, those horse those 500 horsepower electric motors were probably 12 feet tall um, and almost as big around, 15 of them. And that is to control the humidity and the temperature. But this, this was no small task. And I thought, well, you know, the ants are really doing a pretty good trick here when they grow mushrooms 
it's not easy. They know what they're doing. I think that in the ditch, somebody told them how to do it and taught them. And it wasn't depending on them to teach their kids that they were taught. This critter is another type of ant called a honeypot ant. Their abdomens act as storage vessels. Some of my brethren may try to do that themselves, but this, this, this is not an example <coughs> for how we store food, but the idea of storing it is, of course. They turn into honeypots. They're designed that way when they emerge from the pupil and they attach themselves to the ceiling and lose their mobility. They provide a food source for their fellow ants when food is scarce. The worker ants will collect food to feed them more than they need to sustain themselves. It gets stored in their abdomens. And when needed, the ants will stroke the honeypot ant, causing the honeypot to produce the stored liquid. Someone drew a cartoon like this, and that's not quite the way it works, but that's the bottom line effect. The actual transfer comes from a process that looks like the ants are kissing. Uh, they have two stomachs, one for themselves and one for others, called the social stomach. Uh, they appear to be kissing, but they're actually feeding each other from their social stomach. Prophylactis is the fancy word for that. Uh, sharing food from their social stomach that has been stored. Uh, you think somebody figured that in some app, sat down somewhere and just said, uh, let's, let's evolve this system. Uh, that's an obvious indication of God's design and wisdom which Solomon points us to. Another type of ant that has been called shepherd ants or the cowboy ants. They herd aphids. And the aphids, uh, once they're stroked with the antenna, will stimulate the release of a sugary honeybee. And they're herded like cattle. They keep their cattle well fed. When the food runs out for the aphids, they'll move them over to greener pastures. They'll protect them from wasps or other parasites. And in cold climates, they carry the aphids' eggs back to their nest during the winter. When spring comes, they carry them out again so that they hatch and then feed them. Uh, these are like cat boys that take care of their cattle. And these are ants. I think that's astounding. It's from a book. I think I have two copies back in our library here at Oxford University talking about the fact that in cold climates, and this is one of the things mentioned in the book, they're well prepared. Ants and antifoods, pun intended, Ants really do produce antifreeze, a glycoprotein, a secreted into the bloodstream, where it fills spaces around the cells. The colder it gets, the more antifreeze is actually produced. But you can't freeze ants. They're prepared. They use life. And we'll conclude with a statement here from Science News that says, since the reign of the dinosaurs, they have not changed it yet. Look in the uh, amber. We have some samples of that in the museum. Um, they're just exactly like they've always been. And that's what even the evolutionists acknowledge. Diligent in their preparation, industrious, no slackers or shirkers, never go on strike, and boy, they know what they're doing. Go to the end learn her ways. Then Solomon refers us to the Shephanim. At least that's the way 
most modern translations translate it, the rock badger is the term used in the New King James English Standard. In the uh, they're not a mighty people, maybe 10 pounds, uh, pretty decent size, but they're just cute and cuddly and completely helpless. How would they fend off a coyote, uh, a wolf? They're not a mighty people, yet they make their homes in the cliffs. Now, it looks like a more robust version of a guinea pig, but it's not a rodent. It's squatting, furry, and found across Africa, the Middle East, Israel, Jordan. They like, to, and they, they make their home in the rock formations, uh, very in hospitable looking nooks on sheer cliff faces, um, maybe two feet long. But this is their home, and they're secure, and they're safe. Uh, they know how to stay with the secure refuge, and Solomon points us to that. Interestingly, the hydrax, which is another word that Holman translation uses that as well as several others. That's really the more technical, scientific name, hybrid. It has a history, and forgive me if I diverge slightly into a topic that you've heard me on before. Uh, this, this, if you look at the horse evolution textbook illustrations, everybody's seen it. Uh, you've got the little bitty horse and the bigger horse and the bigger horse. The first one is the hydrocatherium, it means hydrox-like. This was the original fossil, uh, named in 1840 by Richard Owen, and he called it hydrocatherium, or like a hydrax. And that's what it's supposed to be, the first horse. It's a fossil of a hydrax. Now, wait a minute, I've looked at that hydrax. That's Look a lot like a horse to me. But here in the Oxford uh, Museum, Natural History Museum of 2016, evolutionary origins of the modern horse can be traced back to the beginning. You see the first horse, the hydrocatherium, which means like a hydrax. Well, uh, okay, maybe you can picture that as a horse, but I think that's pretty silly. He makes a good hydrax, but that's not a horse. This is the way it's in the textbooks. Interestingly, as you look at this picture, which has convinced a lot of people, the first one here is hydrocatherium, which is the rock badger, the hydrax. It's not a horse at all. The others are horse-like, but all of the others are found in one deposit. Five species, they call it, in the same volcanic ash bed, Ashfall National State uh, State Park uh, here in the U.S. And that, if you got them all together in one pile, that means they all live together. They were just different varieties. And uh, you stack them up and put them in the textbook and make it look like evolution, but it's varieties of the same critter that lived at the same time. Like a hydrax is a concept that has gotten pretty worn, and uh, they're a little sensitive about it, and so now some are trying to say, no, it's more like an elephant. <laughs> this is from Wikipedia. Hydraxes are sometimes described as being the closest living uh, relative to the elephant. Although whether this is so is disputed, I can imagine that. Does that look like an elephant to you? I, I just think that's <laughs> sillier than the horse. I don't think they're making any progress. I think we got real good evidence for three kinds. Good hydraxes, good horses, good elephants. And those are kinds, and that's the way it's been. The hydraxes are one of those kinds, and Solomon says, look at these. <clears throat> they make their homes in the cliffs. Psalm 104, the high mountains are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge 
for the hydraxis. They can be safe there. We need to understand the refuse that provided by the rocks, the clefts, and the rocks. We think of Jesus who said, I'll build my house, my church on this rock. Matthew 7, the wise man built his house on the rock, it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. All kinds of passages that would express this idea. Jeremiah 10, verse 23, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not himself, is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Now, I don't think that Hydrax figured out how to avoid the dangers. I think he was taught, and he learned well. Like the Hydraxes, we too are helpless unless we have our refuge in the rock. Isaiah 28, for we've made our lives our refuge. They had gone down to Egypt to try to get some help and protection where God told them not to go. He told Israel, you've made lies your refuge. Well, you ought to know better than that. First Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, we should not trust in ourselves. That in God who raises the dead and delivered us from a great death, does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Psalm 94, verse 22, thou, Lord, be my refuge, my God, and the rock of my refuge. Psalm 9, the Lord will be stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in the time of trouble. Deuteronomy 23, the eternal God is a dwelling place underneath of the everlasting arms. Without God, the hydrax built us. Without the cliff of the rock and the land, all our is ourselves. Continuing in Solomon's lessons, he refers us to the locusts. Does he look very wise to you? Not that impressive. Maybe something you want to stomp. Uh, what do we learn from the locusts? They can be very impressive and disastrously dangerous when they work together. Uh, absolutely devastating. You recall being in Israel, uh, actually at the crossing of between Israel and Jordan, and we were waiting. Some of you know Steve Rudd. He runs our website uh, up in Canada. Uh, Steve uh, is different. He's, he's a brilliant fellow. I mean, so useful. And he's accomplished so much. It's amazing, but he's, he's just wired a little differently. And if you know him, you know what I'm talking about. He was there with us, and here is a huge flock of locusts that come flying over that just blocked out the sun. And we were in awe, and of course, you've read of such events in Scripture. He was around at Steve, and he had one that he caught. He said, take a picture of me. I'm John the Baptist. <coughs> well, yeah, that's what John the Baptist said. I took the picture. About the time our Israeli general says, nobody touched the locusts, they've been poisoned, that's why they fell to the ground. Spewed it out. But we do see those huge flocks over there in that part of the country. He's eating the wheat, and that doesn't look that dangerous. But as Solomon says, yet all of them go out in ranks. Uh, and it looks like they're just a mass, but the truth is somebody's directing you, especially when you back off and see the formation. Who's driving that boat? Some of them are just astounding 
of these formations. Now that that doesn't happen willy nilly. You just they jump up and fly. No. Someone is directing them. They go out in ranks. Look at that. That did not just happen. God, of course, used the destructive force of the cooperative effort of the locusts on a number of occasions. Exodus 10, we read about it down in Egypt. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt settled in all the territory of Egypt. They were very numerous. They covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was darkened. This is a more recent picture from Kenya. And yes, it darkens the sky. In Exodus, they ate every plant of the land, all the fruit of the trees, the hail left. Thus nothing green was left on the tree of the plant of the field throughout the land of Egypt see in this aerial view of the advance of the locust. And you can see what's behind and you see what's ahead. That little creature doesn't seem that impressive until he gets together with his friends and somebody dropped in that boat and it is organized. They go out in ranks. Wow. Reminded of the comment in Matthew 12, Jesus says, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. If we're not together, we're not going to get very far. In John 17, verse 20, Jesus said, We do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe that they will all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they all may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. We can get the job done, working together. Maybe each one is not that forceful, but together. With God's direction, they turn the world upside down. First Corinthians 1, now I exhort you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you. Has Christ been divided? <clears throat> Look at the locusts. I think we can see the force of that lesson. Tiny, helpless, until they work together in ranks. And they can destroy powerful nations and bring pharaohs to their knees. And then he refers us to the lizard. <clears throat> you may grasp with the hand. He's ferocious. Well, you can reach down and pick him up. Yet it is in king's palaces. He's not afraid to just march right up to the king or hide behind the king's chair. Uh, the world biblical commentary says it seems to be a humorous jive at human beings who might dearly love to have access to the palace of the king, that even the lizards can find a place there. Too often we find ourselves afraid to go and take advantage of opportunities that open before us. Matthew 25, Jesus was talking about that with the parable of talents and rebuking the one who said, I was afraid, went away and hid your talent in the ground. Throw out the worthless slave in the outer darkness in that place there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God doesn't countenance cowards. And here Solomon is pointing to the one who is ready to go wherever, whenever, not intimidated. Last Lord's Day we talked about courage that exhibited in the apostles. They had they observed the confidence of Peter and John, understood that they were uneducated, untrained. They recognized they'd been for Jesus who had commanded Matthew 10, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill itself. In Revelation 1, we have a list of those who will be judged eternally. He who uh, sits on the throne said, 
but for the cowardly. He will be in the lake that burned the fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God says we put up the cowards. So we learn from the little creatures. Industry. Design from God from the ants. The force of cooperation from the locusts. Depending on the refuge, the ultimate source of protection from God from the hydraxis. And courage from the lizard. We need to take advantage of the opportunities that are ours. Take refuge in the rock of ages while you have opportunity to cooperate with God's people and courageously take your stand. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, learn from the preachers. It's time to get up and go now. Let's conclude with the word of prayer. We're thankful, Father, for it your blessings, the wisdom which you reveal to us. Help us to take lessons from the little creatures and from your divine word into our heart and to live it out in our lives. Give us opportunities to serve and courage to step through the door and to utilize the opportunities that you promise. Pray for those who may be disobedient. We pray that they repent and return. In our Savior's name we pray. Amen.